Hello and welcome. I'm Heidi from the Wisdom Factory. And we are here together with Martina Vollbrecht and Grace Kim Thorne. And we were invited to participate at a conference, which is called Growing Up Conference, and with a specific topic, conscious dying. Ooh, dying. No, it's not as bad as it is. We have experience with that. And we want to talk about how occupying oneself with death contributes to our growth and also to the growth of the people who are preparing for death or who are dying. And I'm confident that something will come out of our conversation. And I will ask every one of you to introduce yourself and say a little bit about yourself, logically, your interest and how it comes. I mean, I see you, Grace, you are quite young. How is it that you are uh, occupied with this topic? So I give over to you first. <laughs> Thank you so much. It's lovely to be here. Um, yes, I think it's awful childish that we don't talk about death because statistics show that 100% of us are going to die. <laughs> So I'm really thrilled to be here to talk about it and demystify it a little um, because it is that taboo subject, which is just absolutely bizarre um, to me. Now, yes, I know I, I am young and, you know, it's not often that you'll see someone um, that's really passionate about talking about death and doing death differently, but we all have our stories and experiences that bring us to the place that we are. So I've known death very closely um, and I experienced in a way that completely discombobulated me. Um, I had no idea um, how to deal with it. So I'll tell you a little bit um, about that. My son's biological father um, died very suddenly you know, and I was left with a 22-month-old and I had no idea, I'd had no conversation about anything, you know, that his wishes were, you know, I, I knew that he wanted to be buried back in Turkey. I had no idea where or how to get a body back to Turkey. Um, all these things that you deal with and sudden death particularly is, is very difficult because, it's just all thrown upon you. And um, so from that moment, then after then, you know, obviously I, I, uh, I knew when I grew through that experience. Um, and, and then my grandmother, who I was very, very close to, um, she got diagnosed with a terminal illness. And I was like, oh, it's happening again. And it's a feeling, it's a feeling that you'll only know when you're in it and you'll only appreciate support and you know that it can be done differently when you're in the throes of it um so that experience with my with my grandmother it, you know i had some conversations with her you know which were truly beautiful um in the dying process and when you are around death i believe it can be the most beautiful experience where we can open up and we can truly, truly connect in a really raw, authentic, um, spiritual way. Um, so I believe death can be done differently. Um, and then through law of attraction and how things find you when they're meant to be, um, I heard about the, the um, occupation of a death doula. And I was like, wow what is this? This is what I'm meant to do. So I, I undertook my um, death doula training um, in Australia. And that, that was it for me. It, it put me on this journey of, you know, what is conscious dying? Um, why don't we talk about something, you know, that I believe is the most important transition in life? You know, we have birth, we undergo all this planning, you know, we put so much focus on what we want, how we want it, who we want to be there, what medical treatments we do and don't want. Um, and we, we are such control freaks in our lives with every aspect. But then when it comes to that final transition, we don't want to talk about it. 
and it is it's not right um it's adolescent <laughs> it's childish and it's not you know if we're talking about here in this space in this container about growing up about um you know moving into that you know conscious living conscious dying um let's create a relationship with death um so so i do that by supporting people as an end of life doula um, I'm also um, an end of life planning facilitator. So I work very closely with um, Jane Duncan Rogers, who created this book, Before I Go Solutions. And we, we help people create their end of life plan. Yeah. And yeah, we don't do it in that kind of, you know, we, we put, there's a lightness to it, you know. So we talk about death um, and in the planning, I truly believe there is freedom from fear. So that's that's me in a nutshell. <laughs> yeah, thank you very much. Yeah. I came across this book before because I interviewed uh, Jane Duncan Rogers on it and we actually did it. Even Mark did it before he died, at least to a certain extent because he was already very ill when, when we did the course. Uh, and I did it also to a certain extent. Some things I still haven't done, I have to admit. But before we talk about it, uh, I want to give over to you, Martina. And... So, uh, can you hear me? Yes. Mm -hmm. okay. Yeah, um, I was 20 or 21 when I uh, worked for a practice in a uh, hospital, not just a normal hospital. And um, Every morning when uh, the doctors or the, the other nurses uh, said with something like this, there is Mrs. Miller or Mr. Smith is probably going to die today. So not with these words, of course, so very soft words, he's going or something like that. And this young woman, Martina, me, <laughs> was very, very curious, curious and was all the time passing these room doors and looking in and watching and standing at the bedside. And it was very, oh. <laughs> um, but not in a bad way, just in a very curious and open and loving way. And uh, a, what you said, Grace, this is the only certainty we have when we are born, we are going to die. So. <laughs> And this was um, accompanying my life the whole, the whole time. When I grew older, when I was in my 40s, um, I met an, um, what is it, uh, something like an apprenticeship uh, for nursing, nurses, nurses, yeah, okay. And um, I started to work in hospices. And um, after that, um, for me, was very, very clear. This is the way I'm going. This is the way for me. This is like my dharma, dharma to stay with people who are terminally ill, who are leaving this world, who need um, talking or just sitting there, like like you told Grace. And um, yeah, it was a long time at first. I worked in the hospice, hospice initiative. Is it the right word in English? The groups uh, went um, into the houses, into the apartments of people. And after that, I had this profession. In my last uh, seven or eight or nine years working, I spent, uh, spent in an uh, anthroposophic hospice in Berlin. And this was, uh, I must say, my best time of working in my life because it was so open, so, um, so, so wide. It is always, everything was integrated. The, uh, the family as the first point, the, the whole body, of course, the soul, the mind, everything, you can tell what life is, what life means in this body on this earth was integrated in our work. And uh, also, also what I very much like and have never heard before that Rudolf Steiner says, said, um, 
the doctors, also the doctors, they never have to give up hope. As long as the person is living in his body, there is something like hope and you have to share this hope with the people. It's not, not um, a real theme what this hope is integrating. It's not, uh, I can still do this and maybe I see my, my uncle then or something like that. It's just the hope that life is um, evolving till death and after. Yeah, that's my way. <laughs> yeah, as you can see, two experts in death. I have only had the experience, my father, when he died, I was 27. He, I saw him decay, he had cancer, and he became yellow in the face. And so we, my mother had to care for him. And my sister and myself, we took terms. And when he, he actually died, I wasn't there. We went to the funeral, but I didn't see him anymore. And so for me, it was for 20 years or more, I thought, oh, he's just away somewhere. So I didn't work on this uh, fact that he was dead. You know, it was too, obviously too painful or something like that. I still have written, uh, I found it lately, uh, a text which I have written while he was still alive, because in the very end of uh, his life in the last week when I was still there, we created a new relationship, a wonderful relationship. It was, it was overwhelming, I have to say, for me then. Okay, and after these 20 more years, I had experience with death here in the countryside, with animals dying all the time, you know. All the time, this, you know, your dearest cats and even if you slaughter them for eating you know I, I mean i hardly ever did but still i'm by the way of the opinion if you eat meat you must be able to also slaughter an animal to understand what that is uh, but it was also very challenging this relationship with death and then my ex-partner died and i was at the hospital every day with him and took care that he wasn't treated in the wrong way so that he was left in, in in peace and fortunately his children were on the same idea while his new mate she wanted all sorts of other cures but you could see that he was dying so that's one of the questions i afterwards want to ask to you how come that people make dying people suffer so much instead of accepting that they are going and then the last ex uh, experience was almost three years ago with my husband and uh, the three months up to his death they were very intense and he died uh, in my presence and with a friend and we were holding his hand and oh my mother in between yeah she died about 10 years ago and my sister was on one side and I on the other side. She was already gone. She, she died for two years, more or less. So in some ways, that's another question I want to ask you. She missed the growing up process. She, she was getting ever more stiff and like, like an out um, robot, let's say in the last few years. And then at the end, she hardly ever spoke you know, and then at the end, she was the last three, four months I went there too. She was only lying in bed and and I took care that she wasn't treated badly by, for instance, um, people try to give her food. And I say, no, if she doesn't want to, don't give her food, you know. And when the nurses came and gave her the, <clears throat> the in, injections, I... I, I <laughs> First of all, they didn't want, and then I insisted that she needs uh, pain injections because it was painful. You could see that, you know? And when they treated her washing, and so she was, oh, you could see the pain. So I was, there's another question, wondering how, why nurses don't see when their patients are in pain, when they cannot complain anymore, you know? So I had this sort of role to protect her and allow her to die uh, in peace. and. Yeah, when she died, we sang, my sister and myself, we sang at her side some songs and 
it was nice and also unifying experience for the family so the, we were present only my sister and me but then the whole family came and that was one of the most yeah as i said unifying moments we ever had among five uh, siblings <laughs> so i can only say it's a moment of grace of um how do you say sacred sacred moment and i have lived it and i would only recommend to people to not shy away so i don't want to continue to talk very much i want to leave you after my initial statement to uh <clears throat> to answer these questions or also exchange between yourself um your experiences and your opinions your visions so we can start with one of these questions for instance why why are people forced in the last months or weeks or even hours of their life to do things which are yeah. absurd in my my eyes <laughs> yeah um it's 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 uh it's very sad um but and um, Martina, you you will have more experience personally here because you have spent your life working working um, in the hospice setting. But um, a lot of medical pro professionals are trained to keep people alive, and at any cost. So their their intention and their training is to keep someone alive. Um, and, you know, this is putting people on machines and, and making them um, have those um, experiences where, you know, it's, it's not pleasant and you don't want to see your loved ones go through that to be kept alive. So um, that's why I'm really passionate about what I do. We have these conversations beforehand, so we know, and we have a like a a um, advanced care directive. I'm not sure what you. They have different names: advanced care plan, end of life directive, and it states. It simply states, um, and in certain countries, this is a legal document. Um, you know, I do not want resuscitation if someone is at end of life and they're clearly at end of life. And then for whatever reason, an ambulance comes and they've, they've had a heart attack, but they're at end of life. You know, a 90 year old woman will have two paramedics pounding down on her chest, potentially breaking ribs when it's clearly the end of life. But that's what they need to do unless it is clearly stated. So um, one way to prevent this um, your your loved ones are very fortunate that they've had you and that you have um, been in union with family members and agreed. But sometimes family members will not agree. And I'm sure you've experienced this, Martina, where one person is like, they'll do anything to keep mum alive. And another person is no. And if, if the mother in this situation had have had a clear conversation with both loved ones, or a clear document to the medical professionals, then that wouldn't be the case. Um, so Martina, I'm sure you have so much hands-on experience with this, I'd love for you to, to hear. Yeah, okay. Uh, I agree with you, what you said about <clears throat> writing down what your wish is and um, I want to, to tell you a short experience. Uh, not it wasn't a short experience, but it was. If I can put it in very short words, it was um, a woman uh, about 43, 44, uh, um, an actress, and in her last day, she was lying in her bed and uh, was sleeping what was not normal for her because she couldn't sleep anymore because you know like uh, these people um, the, uh, <laughs> the figure of the people is changing she had this one of these very very big bellies 
and with very uh, small and thin arms and legs. And so sleeping was complicated for her. And this night she slept. I know when I came in the morning, she also slept. And she was sleeping the whole um, morning time. Around uh, 12.30, I came uh, into her room and she was gesticulating like this. You may know that. And I went to her and her sight was going out um, through the window into the wood that was nearby. And when one of her hands came down, I uh, grabbed it and she pressed my hand and turned her almost broken eyes to me, and looked me into my eyes and said, Martina, you don't believe how wonderful this is. If I only had known that, it is so wonderful, so beautiful. Yeah. This was, the, for me, the most um, beautiful experience in, in that uh, theme I ever, ever had. And from then on, it just happened in 2013, something like that. I never had any more um, anxiousness. And now I come to the point which uh, it is broken down to, I think. It's two points, um, all this tendency of uh, not watching that, not wanting to talk about that and so on and so on. It's broken down for, for me uh, to, to two points. And one of the points is uh, this anxiousness. And there is a um, um, medicine, uh, not a, a doctor of uh, palliative medicine, you might have known of this is uh, Gian Domenico Borazio. Did you know? Do you know him? He has written written some books about dying. And um, in on the first page, he says um, you can be very very sure that everybody who is confronted with death in a way is is anxious. Everybody, doctors, psychologists, nurses, therapeuts, everybody has this very, very deep anxiousness because you don't know what is happening. Even if you are very faithful, if you have your God in good form is a sequel. Uh, if you have the trust that there is something that is bigger than you, then maybe this anxiousness is leaving. This is it. He tells it. Uh, he said when he went to parties, when he was still um, a psychiatrist, everybody came to him and asked him, uh, maybe you can give me some good words. I'm always, I have my headache and my father has this and my mother has that and so on and so on. And uh, at the time when he changed and he went um, to, to be a um, palliative a doctor, he was sometimes also asked at, at party time, what are you, what is your profession? Oh, I'm uh, working in the um, area of um, palliative medicine. What's that? Oh, it's about people who are dying. Okay, he was left alone then and he could just enjoy the party. <laughs> <laughs> so th this is one the one point and the other point is that nobody learns um, besides when he is tending to the area of evolving theories integral theories and so on nobody um, is working on growing up really growing up we are grown up, okay, we are grown up, that's so just normal. We have some more rights, we have some more um, Pflichten, Heidi? Pflichten? Duties. Duties, thank you. <laughs> some more rights, some more duties, and so on. Uh, but that's normally, that's it. But what really means growing up, that you connect to yourself, that you are working on your shadows, on your trauma, and so on and so on. Who's doing that? Yeah. And um, this goes with accepting. It's not that you work all the time on your things, 
and uh, go um, deeper and deeper and deeper. Andrew Cohen says uh, the, um, the dust bucket, the dustbin. If you go, you think sometimes if you only go deep enough into the dustbin, then you are healed. But you are, will never be really healed because all your trauma, all your patterns, all things are always there. And what you just have to do, just <laughs> have to do, is to accept. Mm. It's me. It is you. And you are like you are, and I am like I am. So this is not uh, something like glorifying identity, personality, or something like that. Like that. It's just, um, in German we say, das Wesen der Dinge. Mm. The nature of the things nature the nature of the things the nature of me the, my nature your nature this is just nature and we just can accept that it's that way and when we accept we are born we are going to die maybe we know we are, where we are going maybe not it's everything's fine everything is very very good mm. we can open up also for these things But this is uh, this is something that we have to bring to the people, like we do now, with mm. your, your experiences, you too, and I with my experiences. It comes to my mind the fact this anxiety, this fear of death, I think is creating all the upheaval which we are living for a year now. Mm -hmm. Because if we could accept that people over 80 die normally, with some uh, lung uh, infections or whatever they they get for to die. No, uh, so we wouldn't have had all this. Right. Ah. I was uh, saying from the beginning on, it's mm. just normal that people over 60, over 70, over 80 die. So well. that's it. Yeah. And the reason why they die, the, not the reason, the, 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 how do you say the moment what the where they die from you know can be different somebody just dies because they are old and they don't make it anymore but but often uh, people die of of uh, lung infections you know that's the old thing you always heard oh he had to go to the hospital he had a lung infection and so on and now has become I don't know, something unusual, completely unusual, no? And then from there, in my opinion, fear-driven uh, decisions done which are against life. I heard when people now, I don't know if you are aware of it, they have to die with a mask on their face and they are not cured anymore because the nurses have fear of of them. So the, the hum, human aspect, which we were talking about before, seems to have gone away in this moment. And so I would like to use this hour to recreate the human aspect and to re to give hope, not only hope, but also confidence that we can get out of this fear and accept life as it is instead of fleeing it because what, what we are doing is trying with all vaccinations and trying to stay alive <laughs> you know and maybe we do more harm than than good because it doesn't heal the root cause of this fear and i have to admit sometimes i have fear too when when it came uh, before the death of mark i was quite confident and then Uh, living his death, I entered into fear, <gasps> but not so much of death, but of, oh, what happens when I'm alone and nobody takes care for, for me? And that's what now happens all the time. And I feel it's so, so, so sad. It's, it's really heartbreaking. What can you do, uh, Grace, as a doula? Well, everything that's going on right now, it's, it's that awakening, isn't it, to what's important and how we can do things differently. Um, so many people are alone and like we've just spoke about, riddled with that fear. And 
um, I've read somewhere and I can't remember where, but the root of all fear, all fear is death. Uh, like as an ultimate, as an ultimate fear. Um, you know, so it's just, it's really interesting that globally, like everyone is fearing death right now, you yeah. know, to the pack, to the point that we're not hugging our loved ones out of fear. So look, I believe that on the other side of this, what we are doing right now, people will see and value so much more because of what we have been through. Um, you know, you were, when you were speaking, Martina, it just kind of came to me like growing up, becoming conscious. I believe that when we die, we become consciousness. Um, and I know that a lot of people in this space will share that belief. So growing up is, you know, when we die, whether we've had a conscious life or not, we become that, we grow up in that moment, we become that pure positive energy. And I suppose it's our journey and mission, you know, to step into that in this physical experience. Um, you know, the, as much as we can evolve, um, but death, dying is the end game. It's, you know, when you die, you've, you've grown up. <laughs> Um, you've done it. It's an achievement, you know, if you can look at it that way. Um, so I suppose it's, you know, in these conversations that we're having and the beautiful work that you're doing, Martina, and, and your experiences, Heidi, and everyone on here that has known death and that will know death, um, it is just it, it, knowing it, being with it, going through it, feeling it, truly feeling it. Um, is a major step. If you want to grow up, go and sit with someone when they're dying. Yes, that's it. Mm. Yeah, I think it's you. Um, Heidi, it's okay when I talk. Okay. <laughs> uh, yeah, you are so right. Some people say uh, you get you um, get enlightenment if you die when you die. Yeah, and sometimes you probably have seen that also. But sometimes you see it in the eyes of the people who die, mm -hmm. and uh, sometimes in in their their radiance. Mm -hmm. Your story just before, yeah, beautiful story that you shared. I had tingles all down my spine. She was saying, "It's beautiful. Why was I so afraid?" Yes, <laughs> if people can can know that and it can't come from us you know saying no it's not what you think it's like this they have to they have to have a relationship and a lot of people like you mentioned do it through religion and they will pass easier um, and find their peace because their belief in heaven or whatever their version is is so strong but for people that have no, no particular beliefs or they haven't created some kind of relationship, then of course it's terrifying. So in the talking about it, in sessions like this, in helping people create that relationship with, well, what could it be? Um, then, you know, I think that's, it's just going to take some of that that fear away. Right. Mm. Mm. What I found uh, while you were talking, um, as some I have written a short story about um, how people who care, nurses and so on, um, should confront to what is coming to them from the dying patient. It's um, like you say. Um, in the in the um, in the Haltung, Heidi, Haltung, and attitude, Buddha. attitude. Thank you. <laughs> in the attitude of the Buddha, so that you are completely empty, yeah, that you are like um, a piece of paper written nothing on it. So that is the way you should go to the patient. 
to the dying people and just looked at them um, recognizing what is coming from them. What do they need? Is it uh, something to eat? Is it something to drink? Is it a hug? Is it whatever? And maybe we make it for the, these um, dying people easier if we are not there with all our wisdom and all our wanting and all our, our this and that, just like the Buddha and looking, watching and giving. Yeah, I would call that deep listening. Mm -hmm. Just be in the position of listening, being aware mm -hmm. and your own stuff, what you think about your, how do you say, judgment, leave them at home you know but just see what is going on i think that's what what uh, spiritual people say being in the present no in the, that's exactly and that helps i really you know in these experiences of weeks or months but it seems like years or let's say no time <laughs> it's no time past you know or or 100 years so you really have a different, you go in, into a different way of being. And this is so worthwhile for yourself to experience, you know, that's a big adventure in being with a person who is preparing for death and observing. It's pure observing and serving. Yeah, I think it's it's that holding space. And uh, that's what the 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 word doula means. Um, it's a Greek word. It means woman of service. Mm -hmm. And it could be, like you said, making a cup of tea, mm -hmm. rubbing someone's feet, doing nothing at all, just being with that open open energy, accepting, um, loving energy, and just al allowing for things to unfold. Absolutely. Mm. I also think it's very um, beautiful to do is the Tonglen meditation. Do you know that? Yeah, uh, explain it a little bit. That's good. Okay. It's a... Um, meditation of compassion and uh, Ken Wilber said uh, or, or says this is the only meditation he's doing since his wife died so um, what was her name um, Terry uh, Treya. 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 first Terry and then she named herself Treya mm -hmm. um, she was doing it in, uh, lying in the hospice with herself and her, her, the other patients. And um, it's a very good way. It's a feeling compassion with all the sorrow and all the sufferings in the world. And um, breathing in, breathing all the suffering, all the sorrows into your heart and turning it around and breathing out love. Well, this is what he's doing since 30, 40 years now, I think. And this is a very good way to calm down and to calm also the other one down. Yeah, that's the energy which is emanating, not only the words, you know. And I have heard about uh, two people sitting, uh, being in bed side by side, and everybody did the same meditation for the other one. So uh, it's certainly helping or even healing. That's, we, we are in our traditions, we don't have that. And I, we, yeah, we may pray, no? But we pray to God. But we don't really consider our role in being compassionate or being with the other person, how important that is. It can be in this prayer meditation or uh, directly when you are here, when you are sitting at the bed of the person and doing this, you are calm and I'm sure the other person is calm because in this stage of life, 
you are not so much susceptible anymore to words, but more to for the to the energies which are floating, you know. I wanted to uh, bring up another thing apart from the initial questions. Um, I came across the archetypes of the soul. I don't know if you know that. Uh, it's a typology, but it's a spiritual typology. And I did some interviews with Marion Lockhart. And one of the uh, main, um, the, let's say it's a matrix, but it's too long to explain it. One of the main factors is the soul age. And when you understand that you are maybe a mature soul or an old soul, or even only a young soul, but the souls begin with infant souls, child souls, uh, young souls, and uh, mature souls and old souls, and every soul age has at least is considered to have about 20 lives. So when you are aware of these things and you have the feeling, oh, that's, that's true, then you get aware that you have died many times before. So why be afraid this time? because you will, until you have completed all this uh, cycles of life, until this is a little bit like Buddhism, I think, uh, uh, when you go into the other realm, let's say, as a soul, you still have something to do, you will come back, <laughs> you know. So for me, it was very helpful to learn about that, to, to understand that's not so unusual that you die this time, because you continue your path. There is a certain aspects of your soul which will continue to evolve. Um, mm. <laughs> so actually, we don't die at all. <laughs> so what's there to be afraid of? <laughs> that's that's very much something that uh, you know has like I know that, mm -hmm. and if you know, if you know that, yes, this body has a time frame, but your true essence, your spirit, your soul, your inner being will live on. Um, how freeing is that? So that relationship with soul and um, yes, I, I actually, I'm going to read that book because, you know, I've done past life work and, um, fascinating but I actually haven't thought of it like that Heidi I know I've had past lives but I hadn't made that link with that I have died that many times um so yeah thank you for that that's a it's another good thing to take note of would you like to talk a little bit about the spiritual uh, path which you uh, think could help people uh, to Martina to to get rid of the fear or to accept the fear, whatever. But to be to be more open to the topic and to, to to not to push it away all the time because for sure it will be more difficult. It is more difficult also because it's ruining relationships as you said the doctor he was happy in the uh, in the party you know when he wasn't asked anymore but uh, there's always in these relationships something which is taboo which you cannot uh, say and I wonder also how it is for you when you tell people that you are working on that but both questions to you Martina first how is it with spirituality how can it help what can people do to come to more awareness, let's say? <laughs> yeah. yeah, as I said before, you just go away, become conscious, go up. Um, yeah, function like, um, like a rock for people. Uh, for me, it was um, the yoga way in the beginning, just uh, study the Vedas, study the Bhagavad Gita, and yeah, doing my practices. This is also a, a way to grow up, just to accept and learn um, what it means to have a structured life, 
a sadhana, like we call the discipline. And um, Krishna in the Bhagavad Gita says, um, if you want to be with me, and if you want to come to me at the end of your life, then just be with me always and everywhere. Do your work for me. Don't cling to the fruits of your actions. Just come to me, just be with me. And that's all. This for me was the way, the spiritual way that was prepared for me and uh, what gave me the strength to go through all these things. And also to accept, it. it is very much about acceptance, to accept, like my older son sometimes says to me, still now, mother, life is not like a, a pony riding or something like that. <laughs> Life is life, and it's not supposed to be happy and wonderful all the time. There are also times that are not happy and wonderful, <laughs> and just to accept everything and to be calm and balanced between these heights and downs. That for me is the way. <laughs> and the question: How uh, do people react? when you when they hear what you're doing and i mean when they're out of context not not in the in the hospice but in other places do they are you able to talk to them a little bit or do they just flee all the time no i don't let them go <laughs> <laughs> good With, um, um, people who don't know me and who don't know all the context, it's sometimes a shock. And uh, they say things like, oh, I wouldn't, I could do that. This is awful. How can you do that? Um, but I don't let them go away with that. I just tell them, like these small stories I prepare always uh, about dying people. <laughs> mm. And I'm, I'm used to it because I'm also, um, giving very, very many seminaries for nurses and so on. And also the nurses still, Heidi, um, when they are 30, 40 years working in this um, area, they still ask, um, how, how, how can I tell, talk to them, to the people, to the patients? I am so afraid, I don't know. And when I start to cry, it's so awful. I, um, am I allowed to cry? All this stupid, stupid stuff, it's um, in their questions. And I always tell them one of, or two of the stories and tell them about the big life circle that, that is ending and beginning and ending and beginning. And I would say about 60% of them are, are going with it. Yeah. Mm. Has to be, maybe you have the same experiences, Grace. Um, it's good to ma make it simple, very simple. Talk about the simplicity of life and dying. Mm. And very many stories and theories and philosophy about it. Just break it down, keep it simple. Mm. Yeah, and I, I find as well. Um, uh, being quite straightforward, you know, even with language, it's very important, you know, rather than, you know, pass, you know, so-and-so has passed over or, you know, it's but the more that we just talk about it as a matter of fact mm -hmm. thing that happens, you know, like someone giving birth or, and the energy, it's energy, it's all energy, the energy around it, um, because my energy around death and talking about death and dying and being with the dying is very calm. I find that when people interact with me and say, oh, what do you do? Or what are you passionate about? And I tell them and I tell them just like I say, oh, I work at Tesco, you know, <laughs> um, then the energy that meets me is fascination, probably more than fear, I'd say. 
And perhaps that's because they kind of, you know, look at me and they think, you know, you're young and, you know, what, why they're so curious, you know, and, and what often happens, which I absolutely love is they tell me a story because everybody's got a story and perhaps I'm the first person that's ever listened to that story yeah. um, and had that open energy about it. And I'll often, you know, when these conversations, it might be at a party, it, it, it can be anywhere, but it will always follow up with, you know, a message saying, you know, oh, it was just so nice being able to talk about that. Yeah. Yeah. No. So you said before, Heidi, that, you know, not dealing with this and growing through death um, can ruin relationships. It ruins lives. People hold on to if their parent has died when they were young or, you know, all of these traumatic situations and they haven't worked through the trauma, they haven't worked through the emotion, they've ignored it or, you know, they haven't dealt with it. It affects their entire life. Um, yeah, I agree. I, I had, I think I was about 40. There was a big break with relationships in my life and so on. And that was the moment when I started to, to become real about the death of my father, you know, and it, it's not pleasant, mm -hmm. but I think it's liberating. It's, it's worthwhile to go through this, maybe a week or two where I was really, you know, Mm. devastated and but when you do it in a conscious way uh, at least as conscious as you can and don't uh, enter into total victimism uh, then it's really helping it's really mm. helping and understanding reality of life which is not only a birth and death but but also your path you know the events in your own life uh, their reality and even if you find it horrible what you have been and done uh, when you were younger, it's a time where you need to integrate that, where you need to say, okay, that was me. Maybe it's not like today, but uh, that was me. And look, I'm, I'm going, I'm, now I'm here. And mm -hmm. who knows where I can get, you know? And so the curiosity you can bring into that. And at the end, it's curiosity also for death I, I think often about death in, in the last year since Mark's death and I'm sort of curious but then I say oh no I don't I still have something to do not now but I'm still curious <laughs> you know <laughs> my my seven-year-old son says you know I'll be reading a, a book about death and he'll come in and he'll roll his eyes and go mom you're just obsessed with death <laughs> <laughs> Yeah. But I think it's that, you know, building that relationship with spirit, you know, like, um, you know, when you've, you've lost someone and it has been traumatic, mm -hmm. loving them and knowing them where they are now. And if you believe that they are still here in a different form, then wow, you know, you can still create that relationship, have your special signs, your special moments, um, because that love, that relationship does not die with the person. It is still in you and absolutely everywhere, but it's up to us to consciously want to connect with that, I feel. And, and we can, we can do the work to, to, to do that. Mm. Yeah, thank you. We have talked almost an hour and I think we should come to a wrapping up of this. Growing up by being, accepting, being with death, accepting death and helping, not only helping, what is it? Assisting, being there for people who are, who are dying. I think that's one of the most important things to not let them die alone somewhere with nobody. It's horrible, inhospital. <laughs> so what uh, as final words of you both to that? I think I have already done mine. <laughs> I 
Martina. <laughs> We're being polite. <laughs> I was thinking at your words, um, confronting people with death, with dying, is uh, the best way to wake up and to evolve. Yeah. Mm. Yeah, it's uh, it's it's just powerful. You can even feel it in our conversation. Um, so yeah, I I encourage people from this mm. uh, have a conversation about it. Just start somewhere, talk about it because in the talking about it, we feel our freedom, and it takes away that fear. And like any movement, I believe we are all here a part of the death movement. You know, we will and are going to do death differently. It will be brought back into the home um, and it will, people will come together and, you know, it takes a village and, and people will come together and, and be with it. Um, so I believe the future of death is changing. We're going to take it back into our um into our hands and we're going to nurture it and be with it and and in that process yeah the the absolute freedom and love and um growth we're all going to grow up from it so i can't wait yeah thank, thank you. you and um i hope this will come because at the moment it's gone worse than it was before and I would invite you maybe for just half a minute or so to open your heart to all these people who had to die in the last year mm -hmm. alone with intubation or, or other sorts of things with the mask on there and abandoned, not being able to be visited by their family. Just let's stay for, for half a minute to think about them and give them our compassion and our how can i say good wishes or blessings Yeah, thank you. And I invite everybody to take this chance, be there. And if you cannot be personally there, if somebody is dying, send them your love through the ether. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.